today we are highlighting the multi-ethnic ministry of North Texas, uh, led by Pastor Solomon Yadessa. And so in the first half of our class today, Pastor Yadessa is going to share with us some of the work he's been doing uh, among the, the various uh, immigrants and refugees that make up the multi-ethnic ministry and show us uh, some of the ways in which God's very much blessing that ministry. And so at this point, I turn things over to Pastor Yadessa. Thank you. First of all, I would like to say thank you for your presence here, for coming to attend, to listen to what we are going to speak. And second, I want to thank Pastor McGuire and Pastor Godwin for letting me to speak to the church present what we are doing here. And third, I want to uh, thank the members of our advisory board who are working hard with me, uh, spending their time and resources, really working a lot of things. And also volunteers from this church, thank you. And donors who donate clothes, shoes, and uh, angel tree, gift cards, in so many ways, you really support this ministry, and thank you. <clears throat> I really feel very much comfortable working with Pastor McGuire and Pastor Galbraith. I receive a lot of support from them. They pay attention to the work of God, which, for which I really respect them. And really, God has blessed me to, to assign me here among you to serve the people of God on your behalf and on behalf of Jesus. So, I will speak about the ministry. Um, the ministry was started in July 2017. In, in, in July, we will be here seven years. So, six and a uh, half years we have been here. And uh, the Oromo Church, Oromo, or you, may, you may wonder, what's Oromo? Oromo is an ethnic group which is in Ethiopia, the largest ethnic group in Ethiopia, and the fourth, number four in Africa, in, in, in the population wise. So I come from Oromo, I serve the Oromos in Dallas, and the Karibu Fellowship is, Karibu is welcome in Swahili. So the, the people from Rwanda, from Kenya, from Tanzania, Burundi, Uganda and Rwanda, they speak Swahili language. Tanzania, six countries speak uh, Swahili language. <clears throat> so Karibu means welcome. And we welcome the people from Togo, Burundi, and Rwanda to worship with us. I need that. So Romos and the Swahili speakers sing, we sing songs together. I teach them the Oromo, and they teach me the Swahili. We sing together. And we translate from English to Swahili language. Our worship service is in two languages, English and Swahili. <coughs> so it was started in partnership with our Redeemer Lutheran Church in Dallas, Faith uh, Plano, and also the Texas District. Three uh, partners came together and formed this ministry. Today, this ministry has one multi-ethnic worship service of uh, our, our Redeemer in Swahili and English, so I say that. Baptized 18 people and confirmed 20 so far. Connected immigrant churches with local and CMS congregations at Bethel and also at Holy Cross Lutheran Church. And uh, also helped assimilate one ethnic group with the existing LTMS church in four years. So number three, that is number three. We did not establish a new uh, independent church, but we assimilated the, the, the church members, welcomed them. Those, the new ones, the, the guests were good in English, so it wasn't a problem. Uh, we conducted, we conducted ESL classes in Faith Lutheran in Plano, resulting with discipleship of one Iraqi woman. It's really very hard for uh, Muslims, especially women, to come to church building for any purpose. But 
through the, uh, the ESL class, we were able to attract more people to come, more Muslims to come. And as a result, the instructor and one Iraqi woman are still working together. And we are waiting when God touches her heart and she says yes to Jesus. So we are praying, pray for her. And her name is Asia, like Asia. So that is the result of the ESL uh, classes. And uh, we are coordinating an ESL class in apartments in Shiloh Village Apartments. Shiloh Village Apartments gave us a space to teach English. We registered about 30 people. They come and go. They come when the job doesn't allow them. They exit. New ones come. So still we are running that ESL class, but we are impacting the community and the reaching out to the apartment community. <coughs> and the apartment also gave us volunteers to, to help us teach English. And some of our members, some of the, our Karibu members, also come and help us as translators when we need them. <coughs> Um, we, this ministry conducts Saturday youth programs in our Redeemer Lutheran Church in Dallas here. Every Saturday, we used to have every Saturday, but due to COVID, we made it once every other every other Sunday, uh, Saturday. Last night was a very good time. We had 16 boys and girls to come and have fun with Sally and Janet and Ron and also Jimmy helping me to, 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 to conduct this. It is an opportunity where the children come to a safe place, learn uh, about God's love, God's word, and also get some food and also some activities which they enjoy, which they are attracted to. And then every other week, uh, Saturday we have we use the gym for older uh, teenagers, teenager boys who come to play soccer. About 18 of them come. The ones uh, who came yesterday are a good mix of boys and girls, younger, below the age of uh, 13. So that's what the ministry does. And uh, volunteers and donations of faith in our Redeemer Lutheran Church help us to reach out more people. When you give us donations, clothes, whatever you have, and in terms of finance, when you support us, it goes to the community, and the community knows who we are and what we support, what we believe in. So, the ministry support of the, the LWM, Lutheran Women's Ministry League, was a wonderful encouragement. They supported us for four years in the past, and uh, that was wonderful. They don't, they don't support three times, so, so they supported us twice, and then we say thank you, but we are still here because you guys stepped in to support us, and other congregations also stepped in, like Messiah Lutheran Church in Heller, and like uh, Peace to Run in Texarkana, and also Lord of Life in Plano, they are supporting this ministry. So the more support we have, the more we can do in this community. <coughs> this community, the Hickory Meadow, Meadows area, has a population of about 35,000 people. And from 110 countries, our target is that area, Vickery Meadows, 110 countries. When you walk in, the, in those apartments, you come across Arab speakers, Swahili speakers, Oromo speakers, Tigrinya, and varieties of speak, uh, nationalities. So we focus there to reach out to those countries. Peace Lutheran Church, uh, I mentioned that these are some of the ministries we feed them. This is around the beginning of the ministry where we started feeding uh, a family who lost their mother, a family of seven. 
lost their mother after coming to America. Reason, she did not really land in the, in the plane. She was sick in the plane. Immediately after the landing, she was taken to hospital. After a week, she died. And we heard about the story. And then we were present at the funeral. I sang a song. That was how Karim Mustad, long story, but I, sh I should continue. Feeding, after the funeral, my wife prepared food and started to feed that family. We prayed. And then every week we went to that family, praying, people visit, and then we invited them to church. Then they came, and Pastor Mubarak said, Pastor Solomon, do they hear what the sermon? Do they speak English? I said, no. Why don't you use that chapel and then you know, read them? That was how Karibu was started. Nobody sat down and planned and calculated, but God used the funeral place to start Karibu. Praise God. So this is around the beginning of the ministry. This family is the, 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 the base. And this is Pastor uh, from Faze Wiley. And uh, my wife and uh, the other lady is uh, receiving, my wife is receiving donations for, for sewing classes. And uh, so many of congregations, which I don't really have time to mention, are contributing something which really impacts the ministry. <coughs> And this is the feeding, one of the Saturdays evenings. And you can see some of your faces. Uh, feeding. These kids are, are, are grown up now. They, they are now 16, 17. But yeah, they are grown. But that, that small child, now he's like as tall as me in six years. <laughs> wonderful soccer player. All of them really are connected. They, they love this church. They love me. They start to call me early, early in the morning. 7.30 they call. Pastor Solomon, what time are you coming? I say 4.30. And then at 11 they call me. What time are you coming? At 1 they call me. They want to make sure I go and pick them up. So it's a joy. Here are the girls having time together, you know, polishing their ways and talking to each other, yeah. creating environment, healthy environment, good environment. <coughs> and uh, yeah, this is the other group that I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the Anyuak people from Ethiopia who live close to St. Paul, St. Paul Lutheran Church in Fort Worth. That was our meeting, our first meeting in an apartment in one family, you know, singing <coughs> songs in their language, which I don't speak, but I enjoyed worshiping with them, singing with them. They are members of my church home from Macalesus when I was in Ethiopia. So we know the songs, we know the Lutheran Church teachings, so I, later on, I connected them with St. Paul, and I stopped <coughs> going to Fort Worth. Praise God. Um, this is a choir from that group after joining St. Paul Lutheran Church. Many of them moved to uh, Saint, uh, Minnesota. Nowadays, only two families remained <laughs> in Fort Worth. So in, when they moved to Minnesota, uh, I connected them with the Lutheran Church in Minnesota, and uh, one family got a baby, a new baby, and they called me, hey, Pastor, we got a new baby last night. You, you need to plan to come and baptize. <laughs> really? <laughs> okay. Then I co 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 coordinated with the pastor in Manchetto, and I went there, I introduced them and uh, visited them as a baby baptized in Kevin. Yes, blessing. 
and this is our one of our visits to Saint Paul, uh, no, uh, Saint Louis, Missouri, at the <coughs> church at the church head office. Here is Pastor Harrison, and uh, talking to having uh, meetings with or more pastors from different states. And here is helping children with homework at our Redeemer. Thank you so much uh, for all your gifts. I can't mention all the names of donors, but I really thank you all who participated. That bless the blessing, touching many uh, lives, many families. The children and the families really appreciate. And uh, here is time with uh, volunteers, Tara, sitting and talking with. Uh, the children. I have more pictures from our church members here. Yeah, yeah you can see yourself. Yeah. And uh, it was a blessing. If this is before COVID. Yeah. After COVID, we start to minimize, mm -hmm. and then we we divided it to two days. Every other Saturday, one Saturday for another youth uh, age group, and another after two weeks another. So here, the Friday Bible study group from Ethiopia, Eritrea, and uh, from America. Jimmy is here. <laughs> and uh, the elder women uh, president uh, is here visiting. Uh, and also we went to the elder women convention. That is where we took this picture. So, so we we have good impression about elder women. When I was in Ethiopia, I, I never knew about elder women. I had to learn here. <laughs> they, they do wonderful job. So, <coughs> one of the baptisms. <laughs> so, how many uh, nations did we reach out? Uh, you can see, I counted about 25. Out of the 110 in six and a half years, we reached 25. We can reach 50, at least 50 in the next five, four, three, four years if we really work. Let us work, let us do that for Jesus. You can see the list. And uh, I don't think I have enough time to, 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 have to mention the names, to, to read the names. Here is a sewing class, Patricia and her team. They meet every Monday uh, from 10 to 12. The women learn how to do sewing. We have uh, now active ones are about six. And registered ones are 11. They kind of come and go. Yeah. They come and go. <laughs> when they work, then they're not here. So. Exactly. So, Totally, we are, we are, we are in, in touch with 11 of them, on and off. And uh, they hear the word of God, the Bible study plus in the prayer times, really they appreciate that. I want to come, I, I don't want to miss a, the Bible study and the, 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 we call it devotion. We, I don't want to miss devotion. So that is how we are reaching out. And um, what we want to do in this year and future, continue to prepare people for baptism. That is number one. Whenever mission organizations ask you for donations, ask them, how, are you baptizing children? Are the, mem are the people you serve coming to church? If none of these are yes, you need to think about baptism is very important. And preparing uh, training, preparing training for evangelists in connection with the uh, Texas district we are working on. We already <coughs> find out 
prepared five for uh, training. So far, we trained two evangelists. One is when moved to uh, to the, the state next to Washington. No, Oregon. Oregon. He <laughs> moved to Oregon. When he's still here, after half an hour, he will pick up one family, bring them here. That trained evangelist. We don't pay him. We don't really do anything, but he is, he is there to serve. By God's grace and your participation, we will prepare at least two men and one deaconess for ministry in the LCMS. So far we did, we connected two churches, but we want to do more. And we also want to train more pastors, because in LCMS we have shortage of pastors. You know that. We have shortage of pastors. We have, uh, so we want to really contribute to that. We are looking for members for uh, each family we are serving. We are looking for mentors. If you want to mentor, connect with one family, please talk to me. I connect you with what fa that family and then you start to work with them. You don't have to, to visit them every day or every week, once a month, and knowing the children, inviting them to church will be wonderful. So we will continue to catechize more people Depending on how much financial support we get, we will plan more outreach work. So please join us and let us make a difference together. Um, I had one video clip that I couldn't uh, transfer from WhatsApp to this. <laughs> it took me really mm -hmm. my, So that, that video is about a pastor from Ethiopia who lives in Minnesota. He did his PhD, but he quit from, from before his graduation from Ghana, in Ghana. He moved to America, and he is in, in Minneapolis. And I catechized him to be a Lutheran Church member, and he became a member of a Lutheran Church. So far, I never saw him, but one and a half years ago, I started to, to work with him. Still, we talk, we communicate. He's ready for ministry in the LCMS, but the next step will be connecting him with uh, colloquy system where he will be ordained in the LCMS and become uh, LCMS pastor and serve the church. I think it's reminding me five minutes remaining. <laughs> <laughs> so that video is that he was talking how I mentored him, I advised him, I became a member, ready for ministry. He says, pray for me. He's asking, pray for me. His name is Tasfai. Tasfai, pray for Tasfai so that he will do what God has called him to do many years ago. <coughs> so, uh, please consider taking part in this ministry with your financial support and by volunteering in the activities. If you have special talents, in arts, drawings, or anything that can help the youth to learn from you, please let us know. It is an invitation for every one of you to be part of this. Thank you for uh, listening. Have any question, I will take one question and then I will leave the forum uh, the stage for Janet to say. Any question? Yes, sir. What's the catechesis like? Do you feel like they're knowledgeable of the catechism? When do you start formal instruction? We uh, we gather the, the students first. So far, we we started the worship. We come for worship, and then when the number is four or five, I start to, to have time with them and teach them the Lutheran small catechism. That Lutheran small catechism is our foundation to teach. So that is what we do. Any question? Then I let Janet speak before Pastor Fire.
Thank you, Pastor. I'm Janet Koshal, and I'm on the advisory board, and I want to thank Pastor McGuire and Pastor Dathway for their support of our program. We have had a great number of volunteers. Uh, people on the board are myself, Ron Charles, Karen Hickman, Jezebel, and Bob Colster. And we also have some of our people. <laughs> and also, we have someone from Faith Lutheran who's who we have. I, I see a number of people in this room who have been volunteers for the Saturday program and teaching e uh, sewing and ESL, and we thank everyone. If you'd like to get more involved, you can um, sign up. There's a sheet right outside where you can give us your name and email address. You can receive the uh, newsletter that we publish every quarter. And if you'd like to volunteer to host one of the Saturday programs for the children, we had one last night. We had 16 children. We had a little art project. And um, they were very cute. They wanted to know why they couldn't go outside and play in the playground <laughs> at 6 o'clock at night in the rain. <laughs> very, very grateful. They come and they hug you. And it's, it's really heartwarming. So if you'd like to donate your time or if you want to give us financial support, you can do it online. We have envelopes right outside here and we can put a donation. There's some flyers that we put together to tell you about the program. And um, we'd love to have you uh, volunteer in some capacity, whether it be art, music, hosting a meal, spending time with the children. We're grateful for all the contributions to the Angel Tree, food and clothing. Many of these children come with just the clothing that they're wearing, and many times it's inappropriate for the cold weather. So they sometimes need shoes, warm jackets. Um, we can always use diapers, sizes three to five. Uh, they have young babies, um, any kind of clothing, food donations, if you want to make it. The pastor keeps a box right outside his office. Lots of people have been generous donating furniture. Sometimes families come and they don't have any furniture and they're in empty apartments. So anything you can donate would be much appreciated. So thank you very much for your support and uh, thank you, Pastor, for Why don't we circulate the, um, uh, the little flyer that, that yes. you produced uh, for today? Do I have a volunteer to actually guess on that side? Maybe. Uh, thanks, Jerry. And then I notice also the, the sign up. Is this the very sign up that we're using on the Welcome Center counter? Uh, Can we circulate yes. that too? Yes. <laughs> All right. Pastor Odessa, do you mind uh, turning off the yes, projector? <laughs> lest, lest I end up be as, as, as the man in the, the text this morning. <laughs> it's a blind man. All right. We are in Hosea chapter 14, very last chapter of the book. And I think we have time to do justice to the, the first half of this. Uh, but let's let's first go to the Lord in prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, the, the harvest is plentiful, but uh, the workers are few. And we thank you, Lord, that you uh, provide uh, workers such as Pastor Yadessa to uh, bring your word uh, to these many people. And that, that word is bearing fruit in creating and strengthening faith in so many. And uh, we ask that you would uh, move our hearts to support this old multi-ethnic ministry and uh, whatever ways that we can, whether by uh, time, by, by a treasure, by, by prayer, uh, so that this may continue to grow and be a blessing to so many. Uh, now we ask that your Holy Spirit guide us in the study of your word so that by it we may be strengthened in the faith and our lives be conformed to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, uh, so you'll remember last time we looked at Deuteronomy 30, I, I ask you to go there one more time uh, because we have strong echoes of these verses from Deuteronomy 30 throughout this last chapter of Hosea. 
So in Deuteronomy 30, we have part of Moses' last word to the people before they enter the promised land. And remember how it says, uh, when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I've set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, obey his voice, and all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you. And he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. The Lord your God will put all these curses on your foes and enemies who persecuted you. And you shall again obey the voice of the Lord and keep all his commandments that I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all the work of your hand in the fruit of your womb, and in the fruit of your cattle, and in the fruit of your ground. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you as he took delight in your fathers when you obey the voice of the Lord your God, to keep his commandments and his statutes that are written in this book of the law when you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Uh, so just a, a few things to, to be reminded of before we, we launch into Hosea 14. Uh, this business of the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. Obviously that isn't meant literally, but what, what does that mean? He will circumcise your heart. He will give you a new heart from stone. He will give you, a, this is something that's picked up in Ezekiel and Jeremiah, is going to take your heart of stone and make it a new heart, a clean heart, a heart of flesh. But what does that mean? What, 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 what is it to circumcise? It means well, what was that about in the first place? Covenant. Symbol of the covenant. So that's the covenant act. Um, so you remember when, when Moses first gave the law to the Israelites, the Israelites said, we will do all these things. And that covenant was sealed with blood. As if to say, all right, you say you're going to do this, let's, let's have a go. Let's see how this goes. And Deuteronomy here is anticipating how it's going to end up. And now we're at the end of Israel's history with Hosea. And so how did it go? So many hundreds of years later after the people had said, we will do all these things. They didn't. And God knew they wouldn't. And so here he's saying, there will come a time when I will circumcise your heart. I will make you a people that actually keeps these, these words. So, insofar as physical circumcision was a sign of being part of the covenant people, this promise to circumcise their heart one day is a way of saying, well, what, what it says in the second half of the verse so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Your whole being will now be that of a faithful covenant people. And yet, who's going to make this happen? God himself is. God's going to do this. Um, so th that's, that's point number one. The, uh, the, the point number two is that all this is going to happen in the context of the people doing what? what? What's showing up again and again in Deuteronomy 13? That the people are going to be called to do this when they reach that point where it's been demonstrated to themselves and to everybody else that they have not been faithful. What are they called to do at that point? Repent. To repent. And, and, and how is that put? What's, what's the key word there in Deuteronomy? Uh, return or return. Yeah, which, is, which is the same word in Hebrew. <clears throat> Yeah, to turn, to turn back. Um, so if you return, you know, think about it. If you return, what does that imply? You were there, you were you were there to begin with. I think, let, let's not lose sight of that as well. That, that 
God picked them first. It wasn't on their initiative that they were in the right place to begin with. No, God chose them and, and placed them in the right place. And now that that's the tragedy, is that God had graciously done this and made them his people, and they had rejected him and went after other gods. But now to return is to go back to the place that God had put them in to the begin with. When you think of creation, but before there was a, a human being to ask for a world to live in, God made the world and then made the human that he gave the world to. God acts first. God provides first. Okay. Uh, the, the other interesting thing that uh, it, it, it reinforces the, 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 the fact that our, you know, our great teacher of, of the church, Martin Luther, was such a student of the Old Testament and, and that this comes through in uh, the, the small catechism in so many ways. But notice this interesting twist in this promise in Deuteronomy. He says, beginning um, in verse 7, And the Lord your God will put all these curses where? <coughs> On your foes and enemies. So the curses that were threatened against God's people are in this day of deliverance now going to be curses applied to their enemies. And so everything gets reversed. They deserve the curse, but the curse passes. The, 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 the curse is turned away. God's wrath is averted. And now that wrath is directed at the very people that God had up till this point used to chastise and punish Israel. So now their foes become God's foes. And, and that, by the way, do I have? Yes. Every coat pocket's got to have a small cat. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, someone back there is saying, how much money are we giving this guy? <laughs> It's like two dollars. <laughs> yeah, but you have more than one soda. Yeah. And then, then I lose it at the cleaners. Well, it it's, it's always comes back in a nice Ziploc bag. It's, a, it's an evangelism. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, that's why all the cleaners around us are, are Lutheran. <laughs> uh, but uh, th there, there's an amazing turn that, that, that uh, happens in the catechism that it, it, it's subtle, but it, it's very much there. And that is, you go through the Ten Commandments, the very first section of the Catechism, and who's the problem in, in, in the Ten Commandments? The people. We are. Yeah. So, so all, all, all these are things that we're supposed to do, but don't. Okay? But then, what's interesting is, beginning in the the hinge of the, the whole catechism is obviously the second article of the creed, the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so when you move out of the second article of the creed, how Jesus has redeemed us, lost and condemned creatures, purchased and won us from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, um, from that point forward, the problem in the catechism is out there. It's no longer us but you go through all the petitions of the Lord's Prayer, and the problem is things like the devil, the world, the flesh. and our sinful nature. But our sinful nature is understood as other than our true self. In other words, just as in Deuteronomy, because of Jesus, wrath has been averted, and now our enemies become God's enemies. I mean, it, it's, uh, anyway, it, it, it's, it's a comfort. It's a comfort to know the people that harass us or the, the powers that harass us are viewed as enemies by God. And, and so we pray for deliverance from those enemies and, and know that, that God sees them in the same way we do. Okay, uh, now going to Hosea. Hosea 14, with, with that as background, First three verses, which we said last time, these first three verses are Hosea speaking to Israel, and then four to the end is God speaking, is God's response. So Hosea says, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, 
for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take with you words and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity, accept what is good, and we will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. Assyria shall not save us, we will not ride on horses, and we will say no more, our God, to the work of our hands. In you, the orphan finds mercy. Okay, so there it is, return, uh, which we said last time uh, is, is that one word, uh, same word, uh, uh, shuv in, in Hebrew. I looked this up 22 times in Hosea. You have a form of this word. So 14 chapters and 22 times this word return doesn't always get translated the same way in the English. So if you're just looking for return or turn, in your English translations, you're not necessarily going to come up with 22. But uh, in, in the Hebrew, uh, that word is there 22 times. And we said you know, th th this is the equivalent of convert. Um, I won't go down this trail. I, I, I will next week. I'll come back to this when I can do this justice. Rose, you brought up last week. What about surrender? That and I remember, and I was at a loss to come up with an example of surrender in the scriptures. And lo and behold, that's because it's not in there. <laughs> it's not in there. So you, you find surrender about seven times, and, and those times all have to do with battles, where one side surrenders to another. But it's never used in the sense of... this Christian. Or the Jew coming back to the Lord. No, ne never, never used that way. You ne never. Yeah, there's never an example of surrendering to the Lord. No. Yeah, it's always surrendering to an enemy or the enemy surrendering to Israel. But yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I think there's significance in that, that. That I think the evangelical use of surrendering as a metaphor for faith is dangerous. But, but I'll, I'll spell that out uh, ne ne next time. And then now you're just going to toss and turn all week. What did he mean by that? <laughs> My whole life long I've been surrendering. You can with your mouth, but not pastor with your heart. Yeah. There's two different things. But surrendering implies defeat. Like it has almost a negative connotation to it. Yeah, it does. To be. Neg yeah. We call it negativism. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, and then I want to expound on that next time. Um, but... Uh, for now, just the, I think the helpfulness of remembering what the word that we get for repent or convert means simply. That, that it now has, has taken on a, a technical meaning and we think of conversion as some experience where there's a, a warming of your heart or some uh, dramatic... Uh, epiphany or vision and, 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 and you go from being this kind of person to, to this kind of person in this very uh, dramatic way and that does happen from time to time you think of Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus but he couldn't have done that without Christ R right but, but my point is to think that that's what conversion must look like in every case is not warranted by scripture no that what is it to repent? What is it to be converted? It's, it's now to go a different direction. Do a, it, it, it's to be turned. It's to be turned in the right way. Yeah. Okay. Um, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. I think NIV it, it does this even more vividly. And who's got NIV? No, no one? <laughs> Will. Yes. And what does it say? What part of 14? The, the second part. <laughs> verse first. 1, second half of the verse. Which verse? First. Oh, okay. It says, uh, your sins have been your downfall. Your sins have been your downfall. Hear that? They, they, they tripped you up. They've caused you to fall headlong. That kind of idea. Stumble. To stumble. Right. But ESV has stumble, which, which is fine. But, but, but I like downfall, you, you know, you've really got this, this physical effect, and, and it's, it's their own sin has caused them to do this. They have tripped up over their own sin. Uh, it's, it's not God that's abandoned them. They've run away. They've, their own sin has caused them to be in the 
the, the, the prone position that they find themselves in. And now this is very interesting. Um, I don't know if NIV does, does something different with this, but, but this is very literal from, from the, the Hebrew text that, as we have it. Take with you words. What does that mean? Take with you words and return to the Lord. Take with you words. I, I think this is the only time we see this expression. In, in all of the Old Testament. It's just not something you ordinarily see. And it's, it's a strange idea, isn't it? Right? Take, you know, take, carry, bring no. <laughs> with you words. So what, what could this be getting at? Yeah, yeah. Like recalling the promises God has made before. Yeah, see, we, we, we talked last time about, you know, I brought up the, the subtle but very important difference between keeping and obeying God's words. That, you know, and, and Carol brought up Mary, pondering these things in her heart, treasuring these things uh, in, in her heart. Uh, that, that, that keeping is, is the bigger thing. Obey is the action. And see, well, this is anticipating a point I want to make in, in just a second about verses 2 and 3, but you, you, you can obey without keeping. You, you, you can just do the thing that you are told without having any internal conviction that this is the right thing to do or that, that I can trust that what I'm doing is right because it's coming from, from God who's altogether trustworthy. But, but to keep, to keep the words means to, to have them inside you. And, and therefore, I, I'm doing this with, with, with all my heart and all my soul, but, but ultimately I'm doing it out of belief, which, which is, which is the, the, the ultimate keeping of God's word, for God to make a promise to you and your reaction, your response to be, amen, this must be true, this must be so. You know, to, to, again, to go back to Mary. The, the, the angel tells her, makes no sense to her, but be it unto me as, as you have said as the Lord has spoken, that, that, that kind of idea of keeping. And so take with you words and return to the Lord. Um, who, whose words, we might ask? God's words. Probably God's words. And, and so what, what's the image of to take with you words and return to the Lord? Ten Commandments, perhaps. Maybe Ten Commandments. Yeah, or to take them. Although in this case, you're taking these words with you to the Lord. So what does that look like? The return. Maybe praise. Well, I, I think it's especially given what follows. Confession. See, in other words, and, and, and this is one of the things that our own service captures. The traditional divine service captures this very idea. Um, well, in, in, in a couple of ways. Actually, the confession of sins and absolution at the very beginning of the service isn't part of the service proper. That, that, that it just so happens that's become the way we begin the divine service, but it wasn't always. That was, that was considered a, a separate event. Now, it might have happened just prior to the service beginning, uh, but in a different context, or it might have happened, confession and absolution might have happened one-on-one -on -one with the pastor the night before, that kind of thing, or it might have happened sometime earlier in the week, but it wasn't part of the service proper. The, the divine service really begins, officially begins with what? What comes after the announcement of forgiveness in, in the service? What's the very next thing that happens? The intro it. Very good. And what do we mean by intro it? Entrance. Yeah, exactly. Entrance. And, and so I don't go into... You know, this is the kind of thing, oh, see, 
I got an upgrade in terms of having a shelf for my coffee, but I lost a marker holder. There's always trade-offs. There's always trade-offs. Does the marker stay with the board? The marker should stay with the board, but the marker is not with the last section. Okay. Well, imagine I'm writing the words I, letters I, N, T, R, O, I, T. Latin for he or she enters, enters. And th this is what's going through my head. Maybe I shouldn't let you in you know, behind the curtain like this. Um, but when we do the intro, it, I try to remember to some point during the intro, it step forward towards the altar. Because that's what it's supposed to represent, an entering into God's, the, presence. God's presence. That's exactly right. That, that's I gotcha. But, but what's significant here is, the intro it is itself what? What's the content of the intro? What are what kinds of things are we saying? Often a psalm. Not always, but nearly always, it, it's selected verses from a psalm that's connected with the theme for that particular Sunday. Uh, it, it's often that the first words of the intro at Psalm are where you get your the name of that Sunday. Yeah, I mean in, in Latin. In Latin, you know, if there's a Latin name for the Sunday, it's because that's the first word in Latin of the intro at Psalm. Nearly always. Uh, you know, you know the, the, the example I, I like to give that we all know, Quasimodo, right? We all know Quasimodo, okay? Quasimodo, Hunchback of Notre Dame, the reason he's called that is because Quasimodo in the, in the story is laid at the steps of Notre Dame on Quasimodo Sunday. The, the Sunday after Easter, first Sunday after Easter, where the intro at Psalm is, and here's an exception, not a psalm, it's, it's from um, 1 Peter, right? The verse from 1 Peter that says, like newborn babes, uh, crave the, the pure spiritual milk, right? But the first word in Latin is quasimodo geniti, uh, so like, like newborn uh, you know, literally in, in, in Latin, that, that that's what that word means, and, and so it's it's called that Sunday, and that's why Quasimodo the Hunchback is named that. Okay, okay. But but here the 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 idea is we begin the service speaking words to God that He has first given to us. I think that's the great significance of the divine service, starting with the intro at Psalm. That we begin in a confidence that this is pleasing to God because these are God's own words. And so we're quoting back to God what God has first spoken, spoken to us. Yeah. Why in the NRV did they change the order, but they're using the same, like the same words? There's no benefit to it, and it takes the emphasis off words. And in NIV it says, take words with you instead of take with you words. Oh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It seems to take the emphasis off of words. Yeah, yeah, it, it does. But by, by kind of uh, putting it in the middle. But I don't, yeah, I don't know why it. they would have changed it because it hurts the emphasis. Right. And it's not even as though it's it's not uh, you know, it's not a more efficient text or anything. They're, yeah. They're using the same, literally the same words, but just in the wrong order. Yeah. Take words. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, what, what a strange thing to emphasize with you. Yeah. 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 I, I do not know. Yeah. Uh, but 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 I I think that. Given what, what follows, what, what kinds of things are we now going to say to him? Take away all iniquity. Accept what is good, and we will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. I guess I, I have time to, to explore this. Um, so we're, we're going to the Lord with words that he himself has given us. And what, what are those words? Ten Commandments is, is, is a great, great idea. How about the words God has spoken through Hosea to Israel up to this point? Now, we, we've said before that, that Hosea is kind of this patchwork quilt of sermons that Hosea <laughs> preached over a long career as prophet. But most scholars agree that chronologically speaking, Hosea 14 is the, the last. It, it is the, we, we are very close to the end at this point when, when we get to the sermon that... that constitutes Hosea 14. 
Uh, and so all those words that Hosea has preached to them before, those words take with you. And on the basis of them, say what those words teach you. That you should repent. And, and, and you should say this of yourselves and ask this of God with respect to your sin. Take away all iniquity. So that is... <clears throat> remove our sin. Forgive it. Accept what is good. What, 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 what is that saying? Probably something like, uh, receive us in your goodness. See, accept what is good or, or, or accept us graciously. Something like that. Uh, and we will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. Now, hold your place. Go to Psalm 51, which you know well. I think this is making a very important point for us all. And Psalm 51 uh, makes it just as clearly, if not more clearly, than any other place. Uh, we know Psalm 51. Uh, we sing it very often in uh, the, the service according to the old uh, TLH as, as the offertory. Uh, at least we have um, this section of Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God, beginning in verse 10. Renew a right spirit within me, cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. <coughs> Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Now, all of this is in the context of David writing a psalm about his sin of adultery with Bathsheba and his having Bathsheba's husband murdered. Nathan's confronted him about this sin. Remember that famous scene? Uh, and... and uh, Nathan tells him a story where the, the names and the uh, places have been changed and, and, and David gets very indignant at a person who would act like this and the punchline is, the you are the man. Uh, and, and so now we have this psalm of repentance, Psalm 51, which says among other things, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Okay? So in, in the section we sing so often, beginning in verse 10, you've got create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me, uphold me with a willing spirit. And then in verse 13, what? Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. We get that in Matins and Vespers. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good design and your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. And notice you've got the same sequence when you think about it here. Israel is called to take with them words and return to the Lord and say to him, Take away all iniquity, accept what is good, and we will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. But what comes first? It's not... The offering of bulls. The praise. Forgiveness. Yes. Take away all iniquity. In other words, there, there's, there's no hope in offering a bull if you're doing so with a heart that still has guilt, guilt from sin. It, it's like trying to clean a window with oily hands. Our dirty rags. So first, cleanse our heart. Give us faith. And only then do the sacrifices make sense. Are the sacrifices acceptable? And, and, and this is a lesson for us that the things we do in worship aren't the main thing. The main thing is faith. That what we do in worship is done with a heart that believes we are doing them for a God that forgives us. 
you, you see? You, and now, don't get me wrong. God does prescribe certain things that we are to do in worship. But even if we did them without faith, it's not acceptable. Not acceptable. It's not the performance of the actions that's pleasing. It's the heart in which they're performed. Pastor, a good example is Cain and Abel. You're right. And one one person. in faith, one went out of faith. There you go. Right. But a lot of examples. A lot of examples. And here's David. He says, on the one hand, right, you, you won't accept any sacrifices. Because what you, what you demand is a, a broken and a contrite heart. You demand a repentant heart. But then he turns around and says, then I will offer bulls. Right? So the sacrifices, are there's a place for them, but for the one who does them in faith. And, and, and so, uh, you know, in, in the Reformation, one of, one of the issues the Reformation fought over was it wasn't a doctrine per se, but it was certainly a description of, of a common practice and it was this understanding in Latin, ex opere operatum, which was to say that the, the sacrament performed did its thing regardless of the faith of the person participating. And so, once baptized, right, always saved, whether the person believes or not. That, that, that kind of thing. And, and, and no... The, that, that's why in, in the catechism and in, in all the questions and answers regarding baptism and Lord's Supper, faith figures so prominently that, that the Lord's Supper is the Lord's Supper whether you believe it or not. It's Christ's body and blood whether you believe it or not. But simply participating in the Lord's Supper doesn't mean you receive the benefit of the Lord's Supper, namely the forgiveness of sins. It's received by faith, by trusting that it is what God says it is, and it's for you. And, and, and so here, that, that, that same idea in, in slightly different words in Hosea, right? That first, restore our faith. Create in us a clean heart. Forgive our sins. And then you will find our worship acceptable. It wasn't like they weren't worshiping already. They were going through the motions. They were coming to the, to, to the religious centers and so forth and offering animals and so forth, but not in faith. Okay, all right. So we'll, we'll, we'll press pause there and, and pick up next week. And maybe we'll have this wrapped up in about seven Sundays. <laughs> so, uh, let's close in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we again thank you for gathering us around your word this morning. And we pray that word would strengthen our faith in you as uh, the God who takes away our iniquity, who removes from us our guilt and restores us uh, to us a, a clean heart, a, a heart that trusts in you and uh, listens to your word. And we pray, Lord, that uh, your word would continue to, to have its way with us throughout our life, that we might bear witness to your great love and your goodness and your truth in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen.